I mean, hopefully we'll learn things like we shouldn't wait for a pandemic to put these basic social protections in place. We are embarking on something that's never happened in the long history of this college. We have students waking up um, and beginning to be taught by our faculty where the students are located uh, throughout the country and indeed throughout the world. We truly are giving new meaning to being a global college. We regret, of course, the fact that we're not together. We recognize that the sense of space and place is what really makes this a special place. Uh, but we know that our faculty is working really extraordinarily hard to bring about the best education that they can for our students. With us today is a faculty member, Amy Daly, who will also demonstrate the strength of the Gettysburg community, so sort of the breadth and the um, intensity of the intellectual interest that she has. Um, she comes to us from the Health Sciences Department, and I'll ask Amy to introduce herself by saying a word or two about the nature of her work and how it might bear on the current questions that we are thinking about as it relates to the coronavirus. I am, of course, Bob Giuliano, president of the college and your host for this podcast. Amy, welcome. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'm an epidemiologist, so that word has become a household word now. Um, so the word epidemic actually is quite simple. Um, it just means more cases than we would expect in a population over a certain amount of time. So we track um, infectious diseases through surveillance systems to try to keep track of trends and what's going on and try to reduce incidence and mortality. We also do that for chronic disease. Um, I'm a social epidemiologist, so I'm interested in social and societal factors that influence why uh, people get disease and what complicates those uh, factors for, for disease. So with infectious disease, um, right now with this particular epidemic, there is an important role for social epidemiologists understanding how social networks work with spreading disease. I am more interested in uh, the consequences of what's happening right now in terms of how this is going to affect uh, vulnerable populations in particular. As a social epidemiologist, is this disease affecting different populations differently? Well, we know for sure the obvious one is healthcare workers are going to take a huge hit here. Um, and so they're at very high risk, and especially with um, the concerns around running out of uh, personal protective equipment. So that's the PPE that people keep talking about um, with masks and gowns. Um, that is only going to continue to get worse. Um, certainly low-wage earners are often at higher risk. So service workers are often um, facing uh, more exposure to people in general. So they're at higher risk. And then they also have um, more financial risks involved in terms of um, not having those protections for paid sick leave and those kinds of things. Um, of particular concern are people experiencing homelessness. So uh, people in this community and others around the country are trying to find ways to make sure that homeless populations are not um, too close to each other. So um, thinking about ways to find new housing for people who don't have housing. Um, incarcerated individuals are at high risk. Um, and then of course, nursing homes. We're seeing this um, rip through nursing homes pretty quickly when it makes it there. Um, other populations that are at higher risk are those with chronic conditions. So uh, people with chronic conditions are more likely to need hospitalization. And we know that uh, low-income populations are also at higher risk for chronic conditions, so that will amplify that relationship as well. Well, what's discouraging about that uh, description is that a lot of those structural, a lot of those are structural realities that aren't going to get fixed, um, even if we wanted to, over the course of the duration of this pandemic. And so that suggests that the problems are going to be severe for those populations, and there aren't ready answers. Is that a fair read? Yeah, absolutely. And, and the long term implications are, you know, if this extends uh, weeks, if not months, like some people are predicting, um, yeah, it's going to be a, a crisis on lots of different levels. 
Um, there's a lot of talk about testing. And I certainly, again, I'm not an epidemiologist, so I'm out of my league here. I certainly get the logic of testing when uh, you're at the nascent stage of the disease. Um, if you're in New York City now, is testing important uh, where the, the, the disease is so ubiquitous? Uh, how do you respond to the problem that New York has versus, say, Adams County in Pennsylvania? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, I, ideally, we would have a lot more capacity for testing for lots of different reasons. Um, I think that some people are saying we need to have um, even more testing in the hard, hard hit areas so that we have a better idea of what the actual community incidence uh, is so that we can make better predictions and make better decisions. Um, eventually, um, we're likely to do uh, some community level like blood testing to see how many people have actually been exposed and recovered from the disease. Um, I think that we're seeing from South Korea and Germany that um, more testing uh, allows us to identify those clusters because we know that clusters of individuals are still, that's, that's how the infection is spreading. And the faster you can isolate and quarantine people and know exactly where it is, um, the easier it is gonna be to, to try to do something. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm hearing stories and reading reports every day that I think most, many if not most Americans who are experiencing some symptoms still don't have access. And, and those questions about who gets access to testing are um, being made at, at, in differently in different places. Um, some some uh, experts believe that it's most important to get the uh, most critically ill tested, um, and some um, experts think that it's it's tr it's important to try to uh, figure out some of the um, less severe, more mild cases, so that we can try to stop the spread. But what's clear is we don't have testing capacity in this country. I mean, it's easy to be a Monday morning quarterback, but it sounds like a lot of these questions should have been thought through, resolved, and um, dealt with before we were in the throes of the crisis. Um, for sure. Which is what um, people like you think about and help argue for. Um, you and I were talking briefly about this before we started the podcast, but we've seen pictures of uh, people on spring break um, all over the beaches in Florida. I just heard something in the New York Times this morning about a coronavirus party in Kentucky in which a uh, participant has now been uh, tested positively. What I understand about this is social distancing really does matter, and there needs to be a critical mass of people who are doing this. So have you studied or do you have thoughts about how do we get the skeptics um, or the people who are, are, are who believe they're invulnerable to take seriously the collective responsibility that this seems to present to us. I, I mean, it is interesting to see this wide spectrum of responses from panic all the way to indifference. I think young people in particular are uh, indifferent to flu-like diseases. They perceive themselves as healthy and able to fight it. And with, that's largely true, although some of the data is really concerning about young people and the severity of, of this disease. Um, and I taught a class on pandemics, a first year seminar, a couple times. And um, I was always trying to convince them that, you know, flu, flu or something like flu is going to be what gets us. And, I, you know, <laughs> they were more interested in talking about Ebola. Um, if you taught it now, Amy, my guess is it would be well subscribed and they would believe you. I know, I know. Um, I think generally people are doing a good job of cooperating. I think there's more and more social pressure to not be out and about. Um, but um, one of the worries is that actually uh, mandatory quarantines and lockdowns and travel bans actually undermine public trust and amplify some of those fears and anxieties. So um, I don't know what the balance is. Um, I think at the bare minimum, we need to make sure that, you know, people have access to basic necessities like food and medicine and sanitation supplies. Um, lots of people are making jokes about toilet paper right now, but I mean, that's really just a reflection of, of our anxieties. 
Um, but communities are, are mobilizing, but it's hard because we're all told to stay at home. And so some of those community mobilizing efforts, um, we don't know what to do because we're used to going out and helping and being there. Um, and we're having to do that from afar. Um, so I think, you know, people staying connected through uh, social media and, and ways like that are, are helping to convince people that this is important. And I think it, the longer this goes on, um, unfortunately, we are going to see it get worse and, and people will take it more seriously. Um, on this campus, one of the things that has uh, buoyed my spirits is watching the ways in which we're already figuring out how to support one another virtually. Um, and we see it from the students and the faculty. It's, it's, it's very encouraging. Say more about what it looks like if this goes on and um, you know into the fall. What are some of the pressures on the system that we should imagine, not at the college so much, at a, as a, at a societal level? I, I mean, the, the things that I'm seeing and worrying about are um, the pressures on food security, um, housing, healthcare access. And again, I think that for healthcare access in particular, people are gonna get, um, really anxious about it because it's going to affect all of us. I mean, already we're being told don't come in for anything other than emergencies. And that's just going to extend on and on. And I think for the healthcare arena in particular, this is going to be a, a huge long-term effect. But I think um, all of those uh, social services are going to be, I mean, we're already really strapped in terms of uh, money and funding and the social services arena, especially in small communities like Adams County. So Adams County, we don't stand out in terms of being the worst on anything. And we're a small community. So it's hard for us to get uh, dollars here to support a lot of these initiatives. So um, I think that there's going to be that many more constraints on funding streams. Um, and so this community has been pretty good in the past about being able to come together and come up with creative solutions. And already that's happening. I mean, all week long there have been community call-ins um, with organizations trying to work together to, to try to brace uh, ourselves for, for what's ahead. What can the government be doing now? And by government, I assume, I mean, local, federal, state, to help the most vulnerable populations who, as you say, will be disproportionately affected by this whether because of income or pre-existing health conditions? Well, I think there are uh, a lot of uh, things being talked about uh, at state and federal uh, government levels, for sure. Uh, protection of workers, so paid sick leave, uh, flexible leave to take care of sick family members, uh, immediate income assistance for people who are laid off, uh, certainly, we need better safety measures for people who are still working, trying to keep our infrastructure going. And certainly, that can trickle down to uh, institutions making those decisions as well. Uh, we're seeing a lot of communities um, have moratoriums on evictions and utility shutoffs. Um, again, finding safe and uh, decent housing for, for everyone is important right now. I think another thing that's happening is how do we figure out how to increase access to emergency services? We know that in situations like this, um, domestic violence can increase. Um, we're gonna have uh, mental health crises to deal with. And those are some very immediate things. And, and again, those are gonna be longer term um, issues to grapple with. Substance use for sure um, could, increase and people are gonna need access to mental health care providers and, and behavioral health care providers. Um, access to food, so right now, we already have a lot of people who are food insecure on a weekly basis, let alone trying to uh, stockpile enough food to be at home for, for a long time. So programs to help people shelter in place and, and feel like they have enough food to feed their families. We're going to have to think about protecting our food system and our food workers. Um, we have a lot of immigrants and migrant labor in this country and in this community in particular. And so how do we have protections in place for those individuals? And I think just on a basic level, 
how do we reduce some of the red tape that people have to go through to get assistance? It's a great answer. I will say that it gets me wondering, though, about the challenges of our federal system where, you know, <laughs> everything is distributed, state and local governments. And so in, invariably in that world, there's just um, remarkable variations from place to place, both in resources, um, approach and the like. And so um, in some cases, that's wonderful because it's a hotbed of experimentation where we learn. But in times of crisis, that variation, I think, can be deeply consequential to people who find themselves on the wrong side of that spectrum. Um, sure. So a uh, couple of last questions. What do you think we can learn from this outbreak, if anything? Was it too early to tell? Well, no, I think there's plenty to learn already. Um, I think um, this crisis is exposing uh, huge gaps in our uh, policies, whether it's around pandemic preparedness, but also obviously these um, social protections that we've been talking about. Um, David Williams, who is also a social epidemiologist, he often is saying, you know, economic policy is health policy, housing policy is health policy, education policy is health policy, environmental policy, and I'll stop now. Um, but the fact that uh, we need all of these sectors um, involved in, in helping with this crisis, and I think learning about how interconnected um, all of these, you know, from an academic perspective, we talk about disciplines and the liberal arts and, and how important the intersection of, of all of these um, uh, facets of how this crisis is, is panning out is important. Um, I'd also like to point out, um, as, as long as we're talking about uh, these different areas of the liberal arts, the importance of the humanities in particular philosophers and ethicists right now. I mean, we are faced with huge ethical questions right now. And what's coming up in the media this week that's really bothersome to me is this false um, question about do we focus on public health or saving the economy? And of course, we have we can't separate these things. These are not separate issues. And the fact that it's even coming out this way and being politicized is is uh, disheartening for sure. And as you were saying uh, just a minute ago, um, ideally we would have thought about what those ethical considerations and frameworks are beforehand so that as we go into a crisis, we have good ways of making decisions because no matter what, there's not gonna be a good decision, a really good decision here, right? I mean, it's, we're faced with literally death here um, and ongoing suffering. And so how do we make those decisions ethically and how do we work together? Well, and as I'm fond of saying, part of what also we teach is the ability to build bridges and build coalitions and uh, create those connections that move forward um, issues effectively. And what we're seeing now is the importance of leaders who can really build those bridges, get those coalitions going, motivate and um, um, create the environment in which progress can be made. So. Boy, the world has changed dramatically in the last in the last three weeks. As you and I are sitting in our homes, um, not not able to go to work, um, we see this happening throughout the United States. Um, do you think there are long term implications that will follow from this experience that will change the way we, as a society, live and learn? I'm still trying to remain optimistic that. Uh these social distancing efforts are going to um, make it so that the, the long as longer term implications are minimized. But I mean, hopefully uh, we'll learn things like we shouldn't wait for a pandemic to put these basic social protections in place. Um, people are already experiencing um, all of these things like um, food insecurity and low wages and trying to survive. And this is just really amplifying those problems. And so hopefully we take this as an opportunity to actually do something about those issues longer term. Amy, thank you for sharing your wisdom with us today. Um, I suspect, I know I will be relying upon it in the days and months to come as we think about how we as a college should respond to a set of related challenges. So uh, thank you very much.
As I look out at a campus that has responded in truly remarkable ways to an unprecedented moment in time, I could fill hours with stories suitable for the closing slice of life. I'll focus on one, however, because it captures the essence of this place at this moment in time. And it's from a social media post from our women's lacrosse team, featuring a quote from Liza Barr, a senior, an organization and management studies major, and an outstanding member of our women's lacrosse team. Now, I could try to paraphrase what she wrote, but her words are so much more evocative and powerful than anything I would try to do instead. So let me instead um, quote a few uh, lines from her posting. It is hard to express in a few words how much you have had an impact on me. I would not be the person I am today without the high standards of this institution and lacrosse program. From the classroom to the field, Gettysburg demands greatness, and I am grateful to have been pushed to the peak of my potential academically and athletically. Thank you, Gettysburg, for teaching me that when it comes to adversity, we can only control how we react to it. In times of crisis, we cannot afford to be selfish. Some things are bigger than yourself. Now more than ever, it is important to look at the bigger picture. Thank you, Gettysburg. I will continue to live by the lessons you have taught me and will strive to be an example of what it means to be Gettysburg great. We often observe that this is a special place. It is people like Liza who make it so. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this conversation and want to be notified of future episodes, please subscribe to Conversations Beneath the Cupola by visiting gettysburg.edu or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a topic or suggestion for a future podcast, please email news at gettysburg.edu. Thank you, and until next time.